We're in part three of a series called Renew Your Mind. Renew your mind. If you're like me, every day I have to renew, you, renew my mind because by the end of the day, my mind has gone haywire, right? You know what I'm talking about? At the end of the day, you have decision fatigue, you're tired, like all sorts, you know, things that didn't sound good to you, all of a sudden, like you got to have them. And so it's like, you know, dollar menu starts showing up in your brain and you're like, I got to stop and get a McFlurry and the ice cream machine's down and then you know your mind's really messed up when you're on like your third or fourth shop and it's fine. <laughs> but I think all of us, we, we need to renew our minds and our minds have a tendency to run rampant. And if, if we're not careful, we'll live by our emotions and by our feelings. And I don't, I don't want to discount your emotions or your feelings. Those are real and they're from God. God has given us emotions. He's, he's given us feelings. And so I'm not asking for you to live a robotic life. I think that we can begin to live a life when we renew our mind where our emotions and our feelings honor God instead of dishonor God. Yeah. And so uh, kind of the verse of the series is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It's, it's going to come up on the screen. I have it tattooed as my first tattoo and is really bad and it's just... It's a verse, so like I can't regret it because it's like a verse, but like I, it's the closest thing. It's fine. <laughs> Romans 12, uh, 1 and 2. I, I love this verse. I got it tattooed. So, therefore, I, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. How many of you want to know God's plan for your life, God's will for your life, God's direction, the mission that he has for you? Can I encourage you? He has a purpose for your life. You weren't born purposeless. You weren't born worthless. God has a plan. He has a mission. And if you live it out to its highest degree, which you can only do in God, then not only will you live the most satisfying and fulfilling life, but everyone around you will benefit from it as well. The only way you can know the will of God, live in the will of God, is by renewing your mind, being transformed, no longer conforming to the patterns of this world. I love this first part. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, living sacrifice, that sounds scary and weird, and it kind of is. Because in the Old Testament, in order for people to uh, bring their sins before God, they had to bring an animal sacrifice along with it, right? The Bible says because of our sin, something or someone has to pay the price. And so in the Old Testament, in order to, um, to ask for forgiveness, they'd bring doves and they'd bring uh, cows and they'd bring all sorts of different animals as sacrifices to God. And then they'd put them on this big altar and they'd have like a big barbecue. And it would, the smell would be, I'm just saying it's barbecue. I'm, it smells gonna be crazy. But then in, in the New Testament, uh, God's like, hey, the, the, the barbecue is great, but really I want, I want you to be the sacrifice that you give. In other words, God's saying that's great that you're bringing something, but I'm actually going to ask for your obedience more than your sacrifice. Your life now becomes the thing in which you use to worship God, not something else. And because it used to be really transactionary, right? And I think all of us, if it was up to us, it would be easy to live a life like that. Okay, so i got to bring this, and i got to put it on there. i got to say these prayers, and, and then I'm good to go. And the next year when I'm all messed up again, and my, my mind's gone crazy, and my life is a mess, I'll bring another sacrifice, and I'll do the song and the dance again, and I'll be good to go. A lot of us, we'd prefer that because we can just bring a, a payment and then go about our way. We're not willing to put in the work that God has called us to put in because we have no idea the benefit of the thing that God's gift is. So I think if you knew how good his grace is, how good his mercy is, how good his forgiveness is, how great his blessings are, how great his favor is upon your life, how big the mission and the plan and the purpose is for you, you'd be like, give me the match. I'll light the altar and jump on myself. See, but today God doesn't ask us to just bring sacrifices of some animal, but he's asked us to bring the sacrifice of our thought life, yeah. of our ego, of our lust, of our anger, of our hate, of our sickness, of our brokenness. And God says, as soon as you lay it down on the altar, 
I'll do something supernatural with it. So today I want to I want to preach a little bit. I want I want to talk about this idea of renewing our minds. If you if you're taking down notes today, the title of today's message is Get Your Mind Right, Get Your Life Right. Get your mind right, get your life right. I love what Pastor Chad was saying last week. He said, "Life is one not in front of you but between your ears." In other words, if you want to live the greatest life that you can possibly live, it starts in your mind before it gets to your hands. Amen. I'm going to pray, and then uh, we'll jump in. Father, we thank you that today you want to renew our minds. Today you want to remind us of your grace and your goodness. So we ask that today you'd show up and that your presence would transform our lives in Jesus' name. And everyone said together? Amen. amen and amen. Okay, real quick, uh, just a scientific poll. Like this is very scientific. Raise your hand if you've ever been in a bad state of mind. This is great. This is I love that we have an honest church. This is really good. We're starting off on a good foot. Uh, I'm, I'm like you. I have been in a bad state of mind, and I, I try to get back to a good uh, state of mind as often as I can. But there's a few things in my life that just push me over the edge, okay? Um, I'll, let me just say this. I love my wife. <laughs> She's the light of my world. She's beautiful, brilliant. Without her, I would not be a father. She takes two tango. And so that happened. Um, but there's, there's this moment where my wife and I will go, we'll go maybe on a date and we'll get food together. And it comes to the point where we're ordering the food. And I say, hey, Steph, my brilliant, beautiful, loving wife who could do no wrong, what would you like to eat? I'll order it for you. So she tells me her order. And I say, are you sure you don't want fries? I don't want fries. Okay, I just want to double check. I'm going to order fries. My plan is to eat every single fry that comes with my order. Do you want fries? She's like, no, I don't, no I'm good. I'm good. Order comes to the table. The first thing she does is reach across the table and grab a fry. It's got me in a bad state of mind. It's got me messed up. Well, I asked you twice. But, you know, here you go, babe. You can just have the whole meal. <laughs> like, you ever be on the phone with a DMV for four hours? On hold, or just going back and forth, and then it just hangs up? You know, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the DMV is his headquarters. I'm convinced. I'm like, yo, who hung up the phone after four hours? Like there's got to be just a phone hanging out there, just sitting on, on a desk somewhere. Shirley's having her lunch, and someone's like, oh, you're wasting electricity, and hangs it up. <laughs> got me in a bad state of mind. You ever, you ever wake up on June 18th, 2023, Father's Day, with children jumping on your face? <laughs> me neither. <laughs> I, I, I'm convinced all of us, we're just going to, Every day is a battle between a bad state of mind and a state of mind that honors God. And I, I think that God wants your mind to be renewed today. Now, I'm not saying like you should be like obsessed with positive thinking. Now, I'm just a super optimistic, positive thinker. Everything is positive all the time. Nothing's bad in the world. I'm only ever positive. Like, I'm, I'm sorry, you're just, actually, you're just annoying. <laughs> you know, you ever meet those people? Hey, how you doing? If I was doing any better, there'd be two of me. <laughs> Dear God. <laughs> See, this is not a TED Talk today about the 10 affirmations to repeat in the mirror for success. That's not what this is. This is a conversation about taking every thought captive and submitting it to God. That every thought will be a form of worship, in a form of praise, in a form of honor. So I think some of us, we'd rather just like, okay, I'll tithe. That's my worship. I'm good to go. I tithed. I'll go to a connect group. I'll 
sign up for the Guatemala mission trip, but not have my papers in on time and not go. <laughs> I'd rather do that than actually do the work of renewing my mind. And we all do this. We all try to worship God with the easiest, easiest method possible. But it all starts here. It all starts in our mind. We praise God by lifting our hands. But can I encourage you that your thoughts can praise God too? Your thoughts are a form of worship. You know, you don't actually have to say the words out loud for God to hear you. In fact, in the Bible, it says that Jesus is going to heal his friend Lazarus or, or bring him back from the dead. And Jesus prays this prayer. And then I love the, the part after he, he says this. He says, you know, I didn't actually have to pray out loud. I know my Father in heaven can hear me even when I don't. But I wanted to pray so you could hear my thoughts. Even when no one else hears you, God hears you. You don't have to lift your voice and not know the words and then, you know, feel guilty for not worshiping God with your voice. You can worship him with your thoughts. Point number one, you can go ahead and write this down. Filter your thoughts so you don't dirty your hands. Filter your thoughts so you don't dirty your hands. I love this phrase. Thoughts become things. If you think about it enough, it'll show up in your life. So you got to filter your thoughts before you, do, before you dirty your hands. And, um, you know, there's this, there's this force in the world that's maybe the most terrifying force in, in existence. Uh, more than any military, more, more than any idea, it's a toddler with dirty hands. <laughs> Sticky hands. Wet crackers. I love my children. Don't touch me. With their dirty hands. Isn't it funny? It's like, I gave you the food. I, I should expect for them to be dirty. That's why we have wipes. And that's why I will continue to have wipes even when my children are forever gone out of our house. We will have wet wipes in our house. But just like children, if you don't filter your thoughts, you will leave fingerprints of messes everywhere you go. And I'm just talking about fingerprints, but really, if we're honest, if we don't filter our thoughts, we're going to start acting like children with the resources of adults. And that takes us to places we never wanted to go, with people we were never supposed to be with, paying the price of things we never had the money for, saying things that we never intended to say. we got to filter our thoughts before they dirty our hands. I'm not, I'm not trying to come at anybody, but maybe you need to be here today because last night your hands got dirty. Because this morning your hands got dirty got dirty. I'm not talking about just the, you know, Las Vegas and Reno. and I'm not, That's not what I'm talking about, but how messy are your, your relationships? Like, how messy is your bank account? Because your thoughts have collateral damage. And they never just stay in your head. They always show up in your hands. So we've got to have a filter for these things. In fact, I, I love what Paul says. Paul says it like this in, in, in Colossians, or sorry, in 2 Corinthians. We demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What's Paul saying? We've got to have a filter. We're going to get bombarded with thoughts. We've got to filter them. And then it goes on to say uh, in Philippians chapter 4. See, we, he didn't just say we need a filter, but he actually shows us the filter. Philippians chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Right, I love this verse. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You ever see this verse on athletes' shoes? Right, they put that black stuff on their, on their eyes. The verse is there. I always get confused because I'm like, what if both teams write the same verse on their shoes? I don't know. Like whoever's teammates have the most of those verses, I don't know. And I think it's really easy to look at this verse specifically and take it really out of context. How many of you guys know context is important in life? Right? That's why it's uh, sometimes you should say things over FaceTime, but you say them over text message, and people are like, are you, are you mad at me? You're like, no, I just, it was just a lowercase k with a period. <laughs> but I'm not mad. I'm fine. It's because you didn't filter your thoughts. 
Where were we? See, I wonder what your life would look like with filtered thoughts. Probably the worst uh, places I've ever been in in my life, not like talking physical places, but just the worst moments of my life, were all caused because I've made decisions without thinking it through. Right? Growing up in in school, my my friend group, we were in the four corners of the classroom because we were the farthest possible distance away from each other because we just said things without thinking them through. All of us, we, we do this constantly. And Paul here, he's giving us a filter. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And he's not talking about you becoming a superhero. And I can jump off of a skyscraper and not get hurt through Christ who gives me strength. I can win the lotto through Christ who gives me strength. I can, I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. So that's not what the verse is talking about. The verse is actually talking about your ability to be content right now. You can do anything that's presented to you. Through Christ who gives you strength. No issue, no diagnosis, no dilemma, no problem. No obstacle is bigger than Jesus. You can get through it. It doesn't matter how painful it is or how bleak it looks or how dark it is in a moment. Through Christ who gives you strength, you can make it through. And he doesn't just want you to survive it. He wants you to thrive through it. Well, Let's take the verse another step. What if Paul's talking about using Christ as the as the filter of our thoughts. You can do anything, Paul's saying. You can do anything, but it's got to go through Christ first. You ever uh, try to make coffee without a filter? I'm a big coffee snob. I would never do this. Sometimes you're desperate and you don't have a filter, so you got to use a paper towel and it breaks and it's disgusting. <laughs> like people are like, what? Sicko. I'm not an addict. <laughs> But if you, if you make coffee without a filter, it still provides caffeine. It just is disgusting. It, it tastes weird. It has a weird texture. You got grinds up in your teeth, and it, it just, it's not a good experience. You know, God will actually let you live your life without a filter. But the life you live, it's not going to feel right. It's not going to taste right. It might give you caffeine, but everything else about it is going to be horrible. No one wants to be a part of it. No one wants to drink from the same cup that you're drinking from. But when you live a life filtered through Jesus, now all of a sudden you can live a life that people want to be a part of. Now when we're talking about uh, the filter, right, I, I think that every thought should be filtered through Jesus. Every thought that we have should go through Jesus first. Sometimes I just want to bring the good thoughts. Like today, I prayed for someone, Jesus, thought, <laughs> throw it his way. God, I think today, instead of 10% of my tithe, I want to give 10.5% thought. And I filter those ones. But all these nasty ones, I try to keep over here until I can figure them out. And then I try to send them back through the filter. I, I, I just want to encourage you today. There's nothing that you can send to Jesus that he's afraid of intimidated by, doesn't have a solution for, isn't willing to step into the middle of. See, in the face of Jesus, mountains look like molehills, problems look like yesterday's problems. In the face of Jesus, anything is possible. So we gotta, we gotta filter, we gotta send it through Jesus. What would, it, what would it look like if your anger went through Jesus? It would look like patience. What about your anxiety if it went through Jesus? It would look like peace. What would your life look like? I'll tell you what it would look like. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. There's nine. I always miss one. Faithfulness. Thank you. Every morning we take our kids to school and we run down the fruit of the Spirit. We remind them. We, we fix our minds on those things. And I always forget one. I have to ask them, boys, what did I forget? It's a different one every time. Next time, because faithfulness was what I missed, I'll remember it, and then gentleness will go. (laughs) But if you're wondering where the joy is in your life, it's probably because you're not filtering your life through Christ. So how do you filter your life through Christ, right? Like, this sounds cool, but, like, how do you do do this? Write down point number two. 
Point number two, you have to fill your mind so you don't lose your mind. You have to fill your mind so you don't lose your mind. If you've ever gone camping before, then you'd understand that the tent pegs are really important. Because if there's no tent pegs, or if you don't fill your tent with enough weight, when the wind comes, the entire tent will pick up and fly away. Probably some of us, our minds are so vacant from the things of God, when the winds of this world start to pick up, we lose our minds. So we've got to fill our minds. Let me ask you this question. Are you mindful of what makes your mind full? Are you thoughtful of what makes your thoughts full? Because if you're not careful, the things that will begin to set into your mind will send your life in a direction that you never want to go down in the first place. So how do you fill your mind? You, you fill your mind on, on God's voice. You, you fill your mind on the things that God has for you. Now, um, maybe you're like me. I have... I sometimes I just, I, I think a lot, and so like there's a voice in my head. And I have to try to analyze which voice is talking to me at the moment. I'm not, I'm not saying there's multiple voices or anything, but. <laughs> as you comprehend life, there's really three main voices that are going to speak to you. Your own, the voice of the world or the bias of the world, and God's going to speak to you. And our mission is to determine which one of those voices are speaking in the moment. Is it my voice? If it's my voice, I need to submit it to God and allow God to do something supernatural with my thoughts that are only natural. If it's the world's voice, I need to submit it to God so God can handle the world and I can live a life for him. If it's God's voice, I want to turn that thing up as loud as possible. Can I encourage you? God wants you to hear his voice. God actually wants you to understand him. I know it sounds crazy. God actually doesn't want you to go through some national treasure puzzles in order to hear his voice. He actually wants to speak to you like today. The Bible says that the shepherd, God is always speaking and the sheep know his voice. He's a shepherd, we're the sheep. God could have said we're the lions, we're the tigers. He could have upgraded us to dogs. He said we're sheep because we're so simple that without his voice, we're going to wander off. We need the shepherd. We've got to hear his voice. You know, when the shepherd talks to sheep, he's not like. And then when they run off the cliff, they're like, hey, come on, I was talking to you. He actually wants them to hear his voice. God wants you to understand him today. He actually wants you when you read the Bible for it to jump off the page and into your heart. God actually wants you to, to know what his voice feels like and sounds like. And, and we have to determine for us what in the moment is our mind filled with. Because what our mind is filled with will allow us to determine whose voice we're listening to the most. Let, let me give you just a few. This is really practical, okay? If you're one of these four things then you have to take a, a, an extra step, an extra measure to make sure you're hearing from God clearly, okay? Write this, write this down, this, this acronym, HALT, H-A-L-T. One of my friends told me, hey, my therapist, they told me this, it's really good. And I was like, it's, I'm preaching it. <laughs> H-A-L-T, hungry, angry, lonely, tired. If you're hungry, if you're angry, if you're lonely, or you're tired, you have to go the extra step to make sure you're hearing God clearly. When I'm hungry, want to know what's louder than God's voice? The Taco Bell. <laughs> bing bong, bing bong, bing bong. I'm just in a tizzy. I'm like, what's going on? When I'm angry, usually uh, for me, if, I'm, if I don't get good sleep, it shows up in the form of irritation. So I have to go, man, I'm not in the right mindset. I don't know if this is God speaking or if this is my bias. When you're lonely and you're just trying to fulfill a hole inside your heart, I don't know if you've ever been there, so you try to fill it up with anything that's around you, and for a moment it might show up, but that, that hole is endless, and only one person who's limitless can fill it. That's Jesus. I mean, when you're tired, that, 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 that goes without saying, right? When you're weary, you make weary decisions. 
So I just want to give you five things that God's voice sounds like. Number one, it's clear. In other words, God's voice, if it sounds muddy in your ears, it's probably not from God. If you have to justify it to yourself, it's probably not from God. God's voice is clear. Number two, it's full of peace. The Bible says that he is not the author of confusion or chaos, but he's the prince of peace. So if you feel like God's talking to you and there's no peace in it, that's not God talking to you. That's you. That's the world. That's the Taco Bell. His voice comes with peace. That's why sometimes God will ask you to do something, and by all measures of success, it sounds crazy, but you have peace. And so you do something like sell your house, get in a car with all your clothes, and drive to Seattle and help plant, or drive from Seattle to LA to try to plant a church. Because you can live on the Word of God. The next thing is that it screams wisdom. It screams wisdom. The Bible says in Proverbs, it it personifies uh, the voice of God as as wisdom, that it's screaming at you from the rooftops. If there's no wisdom in it, it's probably not from God. That's why it's so important for your life. You should have, uh, in Proverbs it says, a multitude of wise counsel. Right? You ever get around someone and they make a huge decision for their life? And you're like, well, who'd you talk to? And you're like, well, the person who offered me the big opportunity, that's who I talked to. You're like, of course, they're biased. We need a multitude of wise counselors. I don't know what happened when one day we're like, I need a mentor. And my mentor once a week is going to sit at Starbucks with me. I'm going to talk for an hour and a half. And they're going to respond and say they're praying for me for half an hour and we're good. Like, would you ever go to the mechanic if your tooth hurt? I hope not. They'd probably be able to take it out. I don't know if they could do much else. If I, if I needed financial advice, I wouldn't go to a personal trainer. I'd go to an accountant. I wonder what things in your life you're taking to the wrong places. If you're taking them at all. Because God's voice always comes with, with wisdom. Does the wise counsel in your life approve of it? Can they stand by it? Would they approve it for their life? The next one, the voice of God, it always leads to satisfaction and fulfillment. In other words, God's word never leaves you more empty. It always fills you up. God's word, it always comes with those fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It it comes with that stuff. The last one, you know, I'll invite the band out. God's voice, God's, God's voice, it always sounds bigger than you. In other words, God's voice always points you to someone else. It always points you to something bigger than you. It's probably not God's voice if all the arrows point back to your life, and to your needs, to your abilities, to your blessings, to your favor. And what Jesus addresses, he says, hey, all the lilies in the field and the sparrows in the sky, how beautiful have I dressed them how much more can you rely on me to fulfill every need you have? You don't have to you don't have to pray for your needs anymore. Jesus will fulfill them when we put our trust in him. We can pray bigger than our need. We can pray for dreams that we can never fulfill on our own. We can believe God and you know the first time God began to speak to me it wasn't like Morgan Freeman was in the mic or Sean Connery. That would have been so cool. But I had this feeling on my chest of, um, it, was a, it was a weight. And it wasn't a weight that, that held me down. It was a weight that comforted me. Like God had put something on my life. I wonder today, maybe you're here in the room and you just, you feel, you can sense it. There's a weight in this moment. God's speaking to you. This last point, we'll close here in just a moment. And I'm really excited uh, at, at the end of service. We're gonna sing. We're gonna sing a couple of worship songs again, and then we got root beer and like a putting green outside. Just dads, you know. <laughs> so find me at that barbecue. Point three says, fix your mind so you don't have to rescue your mind. Fix your mind 
so you don't have to rescue your mind. And I'm not saying that you should like fix it as in the, in the term of repair. But you need to set your mind on something. Fixate your mind on something. Colossians 3, it says, set your minds on things above, but not on earthly things. Fix your mind on, what are you obsessed with? Like, what do you care about most in the world? In your mind's eye, what can't you get out of your mind? The Bible's saying here is, it's time to fix your mind on Jesus. It's time to fix your mind on the things of God. You know, maybe you're like, I don't know where to start. Start in the Bible. Just start reading the Bible. Start memorizing scripture. Can I give you a verse to memorize? It's really easy. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. That's an easy one. Jesus wept. And I used to, you know, kind of chuckle. You know, the the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus is crying. Okay. Because he's so disappointed in my inability to memorize longer scripture. But you know, the Bible says in Timothy that all scripture is God breathed. It's intentional. No period or T or comma is out of place. And the reason why I believe that that scripture is so short is because in two words, we're reminded of God's compassion for our life. Jesus isn't weeping because he didn't get his food or because he was lonely or angry or tired. Jesus is weeping because he's full of compassion for the people that are in front of him. I want to encourage you today. Every time your mind goes sideways, every time you fix your eyes on the wrong thing, every time you mess up, every time you're full of shame, every time guilt takes a hold of your life, every time you're in a bad state of mind, there's a verse that we're reminded of that Jesus wept because he's compassionate about you, because he cares about you, because he's for you and he's not against you. Because the Bible says when our thoughts fall short, when we're faithless, he remains faithful. That the number of thoughts that God has for us is more than the sand in the sea or the stars in the sky. So when, when our thoughts fail, his thoughts come through. What are you obsessed about? What, what are you thinking about? What's your mind fixed on? Is it fixed on Jesus? Is it fixed on the things from above? Or is it fixed on your worries? Is it fixed on your doubts? Is it fixed on on your lack? Is it fixed on your anxiety? Is it fixed on your sin? Is it fixed on your relationships that are in shambles? Is it fixed on your brokenness? I promise you, whatever you fixate on will become featured in your life. Just keep on fixating on your relationships being broken. They'll continue to break. Keep on fixating on how little you have and you'll realize it'll get smaller and smaller. Just keep fixating on your sin and you'll continue to sin. We see this in addiction all the time, don't we? If you can only think about not doing the thing that you're addicted to, then all you can do is think about the thing you don't want to do. Paul says it like this, the life I live is not the life I wanted to live, and the life I do want to live is not the one I actually do. It sounds a lot like me. It probably sounds a lot like you. And if we're not careful, we'll fixate our eyes on things that aren't above will fixate our eyes and our minds on the things below. Let me give you a last verse. Go ahead, stand to your feet. Let me give you a last verse today. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. Finally, brothers and sisters and fathers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Today, if you're gonna walk out this room, if I can leave you with one thing, I want you to think about these things. Uh, Think about what is true, noble, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable, what is excellent, what is praiseworthy. I want you to think about those things. but you probably won't. That's a lot of things to think about. 
can I just give you one solution to your thought problems? Can I, can I give you one person to fixate your mind upon? See, Paul is not just giving you a bunch of things to fixate upon. He's giving you the description of one man to fix your eyes on. He's giving you all of the things that describe one person, and that's the person of Jesus. Jesus is true. Jesus is noble. Jesus is right. Jesus is pure. Jesus is lovely. Jesus is admirable. Jesus is excellent, and Jesus is praiseworthy. If all we ever do with our minds, if all we ever do with our thoughts, if all we ever do with our thinking is is fixate on one person and that's Jesus. The Bible says all these other things will be added upon you. So my question before we go out is um, are you mindful of what makes your mind full? And um, maybe you're here in the room and, and you realize that maybe your mind has been on all the wrong things and you know you got to respond today. You, you can feel that weight. God's speaking to you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to create an opportunity for people to respond. And the Bible says that whenever the word of God is preached, that it accomplishes everything it sets out to do. Maybe right now it's accomplishing what it's set out to do in your heart. You're in the room and you know you're, you got stinking thinking. Your, your thinking is all messed up. It's, it's all broken. It's, it's this way and that way. And today... You're making a decision to say, I'm not going to let my mind control me anymore. I'm going to fix my mind on Jesus. If that's you, you want to make a conscious decision. Again, this is not out of emotion, but this is a decision to say, I'm, I don't want my mind to be the filter of my thoughts. Everything goes through Jesus. If that's you, every head bowed and every eye closed, on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Come on, hands going up all around the room. People surrendering their minds back to Jesus. Come on, Lord, I thank you right now for every hand that's raised. I thank you for every mind that's fixed on you. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name that tomorrow as they wake up, God, the first thing that comes to their mind is not their problems, it's not their issues, it's not their to-do list. God, would their minds be fixed on you in Jesus' name. God, would you renew them, would you restore them, would you transform their minds in Jesus' name.